Uh, I was told I was not allowed to use a script, but I have a fake sheet in my hand, <laughs> just in case. Um, everything I learned, or most of the inspiration I got, or get, still get, is from my daughter. Her name is Emma. Uh, she taught me everything about life, I must say. I don't think there even was a life before she was born. One day she came back from daycare center. I always took her and I always brought her. Uh, took her there and took her back. She said she had a new classmate or a new uh, friend in the group. And the girl, which it was, had a, a kind of an ethnic name, not a typical Swedish name. So I asked her, oh, so where is she from? And uh, she said, what do you mean? Uh, well, you know, is she colored or from Asia or what? And I kind of lost, she lost attention. I thought she didn't, you know what kids are, they just blank you when they don't get it. And then she ran away doing something else. So I thought she just ignored me like she's an expert on doing still. Now she's 18. But then the next day when she came home or I brought her home, she said, I, I, she's, she's dark. And I realized that she's colorblind, which was great. But I also realized I'm not colorblind, which was not so great. Uh, why did I ask that question? Was that even pertinent? It was not important. Taking my daughter to and from the daycare center was always an adventure. It was very stressful for me because I have a demanding job and my boss was difficult in those days. So the thousand meters, I think it was 11, 1200 meters from my home, our home to the daycare center should take, what do you think, maybe five minutes, 10 tops, uh, but not with her because above our heads was the flight pattern for the local airport. So every time there was an airplane, which was every bleeping four minutes or two minutes, she had to stop and look up and say, Dad, an airplane? Yeah, yeah, that's going to be another one in two minutes. Come on, Dad, has to get to work. Come on. But after a while, I, I couldn't drag her on the asphalt, so I had to stop and, sure enough, do what she did. Look up every time there was an airplane. airplane. And she was, she was right. There was not the same airplane. It was all different airplanes. One had the wheels out, and a few had those swinging things, and one was yellow, oh look, one with a dragon on the tail. It was fantastic. I had stopped seeing. She taught me how to see. And she taught me how to see different things, unique things, that we take for granted. I'm gonna look in my hand now. When I started working for my paper, Dagens uh, Nyheter in Stockholm, there, my boss would be happy, I mentioned it. It was the year 2000, it was the same year that the second intifada or the rebellion or uprising uh, was started in, in, in Ramallah. Uh, there was a lot of pictures coming to the paper, it was always the same picture. It was different pictures of course, but it was always the same theme, it was also, always a young man throwing a rock or a gasoline bomb or having one of those slung, slings. In the caption it said, a young, a youth throwing rocks in Ramallah, in Tulkarm, in Nazareth, or Jerusalem, or wherever it was. It was, it was, it was, it was. There was never any name. These people were unidentified. So I told my boss, we cannot have it like this. We have to go down and see why is this guy, why are these guys throwing rocks? Who are they throwing them at? How, for how long? What does their parents say? What are the fathers and sisters and, and cousins and... and Whoever, their friends, what do they say? What do they think about this? Because we were creating cliches. We were creating generalizations with our journalism. And that's, I think, is very dangerous. We have to be like my daughter. See everything, unique things, be colorblind. It may sound like a cliche, but it's not. And it takes a lot of energy to see things the way a child does. I was in Ramallah. It was very difficult to do a story because we ended up in the same place where a mob of Palestinians had killed, just killed three innocent Israelis. And a lot of them had been arrested from the photojournalism, from the journalists, the pictures they were taken of them in connection with this assassination. To, to be there two days later and try to take their picture and ask them the story was almost impossible. They were very violent towards us. So we had to change venue. We had to go instead go to Hebron where we met a young man who could talk to us. And it was very interesting because this man was very radicalized. He said the, all, all the same things like Hamas says today, 
oh, we have to exterminate, we have to push them out in the sea, the Jews, we have to do this, we do that. But then he also told us a story about the first intifada, where his brother was a member of, or a participant in. His brother thought his younger brother was crazy, and did not want him to throw any rocks in this intifada, because he didn't help anybody. But the story was that at the first intifada, there was a law, an Israeli law, that the Israeli employers could not pay, they have to lock out their, their workers, so they wouldn't get any money. And this particular family almost starved. They were in very bad shape. But his father's boss, in spite of the law, went out to all his workers and paid them unofficially under the table. So this guy was telling us, all the Jews are bad, except that guy. There was hope, even for him, so radicalized, there was hope. Not everybody was the same. It was not the same airplane. It's all different. When I was in this place, my phone rang. I was in Ramallah one day. My phone rang in my pocket. I took it up. They were shooting. The Israeli army pulled up a tank, and they were shooting with a tank, heavy machine gun, at a house. They were themselves being shot at by Palestinian, armed Palestinians. So it was very noisy when I pick up the phone, and it's my daughter again. And she's yelling at me. I said, Emma, uh, dad is working. And she was very angry because she wanted to go bicycle riding. And I happened to have forgot to take out her bicycle key. I had it in my pocket. So she couldn't go biking. So for me, there was another lesson for my daughter. A reality check. What's important? It's be able to be safe. To be able to take your bike out. To turn the water on with a twist of the hand light switch. All the things we take for granted can be taken away like this. This picture here is a very violent and very cruel war picture. It's probably one of the most cruel pictures I ever took from a war, a war zone. You can't realize it, but this picture screams very loud for me. Because the woman in the doorway, her name is Rebecca Masika Katsuba, and this house she's running is a, is a um, uh, protected house for women that are raped. All the women in this, picture, in this picture are raped as an instrument of war in the war and the crisis in the Congo. Herself was raped by 12 men who came into their house, killed her husband, cut him into pieces, made her force to lay on him. Then they raped her, all 12 of them. From the room next door, she could hear her daughter screaming. They were also being raped. We asked her, me and the reporter asked her one question. Are you married? And then she told us this story. She talked for 58 minutes straight. I still have the tape. And we all cried. The little girl with the pink pants on her left side was found trying to breastfeed her dead mother on a field. And I will not tell you the state her body was in. So this picture for me is the worst, the most cruel war picture I've ever taken. Because it's not cruel. You can't see it. A very famous Swedish uh, movie maker, Roy Anderson, he once wrote a book where he used the words uh, generalization, cliches, uh, anti-intellectualism. He called them, very pointedly, I think, the building blocks of evil. And I think that's very true. And every time we as journalists manage to find something, anything, that humanizes the people, makes them individuals, tells the, us their story as individuals, what all this political posturing what all those big words from the power players of the world mean. War and crisis affects individuals all the time. People like you and me. And this is what this story is all about, this picture. In the work helping raped women in the Congo, Rebecca was raped again. Very sadly, she died of a disease not so long ago, unfortunately. The former prime minister of Sweden once told me a story. 
This is one of my favorite stories to illustrate the point that this Swedish filmmaker did about the building blocks of evil. He once told me a story about Tage Erlander, who was a very famous Swedish prime minister, who had a visit from uh, Nikita Khrushchev, which was the premier of Soviet, so the Soviet Union in those days. He was the world's second most powerful man. Everybody, especially in Sweden, was shit scared with this guy. They had an informal dinner with Tage and Aina Erlander at their ho private house. Aina was the prime minister's wife. And he was sitting there raising the issue of the Berlin Wall, the Iron Curtain, or the Berlin Wall in particular that was being built. He called it, called it the anti-fascist wall. Nobody dared to interrupt him until Aina Lander, the wife of the prime minister, totally broke protocol and she interrupted him and said, isn't it amazing, Mr. Premier, that you can build a wall with such precision that all the good people are on one side and the bad on the other. And this is a true story. I double-checked it with the prime minister not so long ago. It's amazing. So my vision, my wish today is that we as journalists and you as individuals try to see beyond this generalization. Try to acquire this color blindness. It's difficult, it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of reading, watching, with your heart, to avoid falling into traps we all do every day. We do. I'd like to finish with a little film I did, a multimedia thing I did from my latest work uh, covering refugees. It's uh, uh, meeting the refugees on the island of Lesbos, where they hope, with the hope in their eyes, get ashore and try to make find a place where says, there's potential for them to gather their human value again. Thank you.